small pieces and devour it. He seems to be very good at that. As the night goes on. Well, I think we accept that because uh, when you come up to vote for a constituency, you're accustomed to voting for a poli uh, political party of your choice and for a candidate of your choice. But when you have a second vote, uh, then it may be a second vote, but it could also be a second preference vote. That is, that people could choose another political party. So far that we've seen in the opinion polls, uh, th th there's been a, a degree uh, of change between those for first past the post. But one of the things that could be happening, of course, is that you can get a swirl that some people may vote for a particular political party and uh, be compensated for by others who take a, a different view of that. It will be most fascinating to see how the result comes okay, out this evening. We'll, we'll leave it there for the moment. We'll leave it there for the moment. Joan. Thanks, Bernard. Now we're going back to Edinburgh to Fiona Armstrong. Fiona. Well, Joan, I have to tell you that Edinburgh is unusually quiet here tonight. I've talked to some of the people who live here locally, and they say for a Thursday night it is very, very quiet. I don't know where all the people are. There are very few cars on the road, even fewer people walking along the pavements. All I can think is that they're at home watching the programme as it goes out and boosting your viewing figures. But I do understand that uh, later in the evening, the cafes and bars behind Princess Street are preparing to get quite busy as one or two parties are booked there, obviously, as the results start coming in. Despite today's very bad weather here, uh, we've, we've got a nice mild night here. It's dry and it's really quite warm here on the balcony. And the city looks great behind me. You've got the castle shrouded in mist and you've also got the General Assembly Hall. It isn't lit up, but that, of course, is where the new parliament will be sworn in next week. And, of course, um, it'll sit there for the next year, next two years, until the new parliament building is ready. But, of course, if anything does happen here, if we get a lot of excitement, we'll be telling you about it. Fiano Armstrong there in Edinburgh. Well, of course, in Scotland, it's 129 seats in the Scottish Parliament, 1,100 council seats. They'll all be accounted tomorrow. But, of course, in England, they're also electing councillors today. Uh, Dennis Mooney has been keeping an eye on what's happening there. Uh, Dennis, uh, what can you tell us? Well, Bernard, the whole thing down there is actually very big indeed. There's 11,000 council seats being fought over down there. It's a real huge test. Labour are a bit worried, I think, that complacency has maybe set in among some of their voters and that people won't actually come out to support them. So they're expecting some losses. Uh, in the autumn there, they were actually leaking that they might lose as many as 2,000 seats. I think they're hoping it'll be a bit less than that. But they could have some fairly substantial losses. It's a big test as well for William Hague. I think it's going to be some indicator of how, how people think he's doing. If the Tories don't start to pick up pretty significant numbers of seats, I think it's going to be seen really as a bit of a blow for William Hague and the fact that the Tories at quite a senior level, as you know Bernard, have been spatting with each other in recent weeks about public finance, I think that they would really be looking to maybe okay. get... Dennis, we'll leave it there for the moment. Thank you very much indeed. We'll take a break now for the news from ITN. Join us in 20 minutes. Tomorrow morning. This is the first time that this electoral system, a form of PR, has been used in Britain. In the elections in Wales and Scotland, you cast two votes, one for your constituency MP and the other for a party or an individual on a list. In Wales, the boxes containing the assembly votes won't be counted until 9 o'clock tomorrow morning. Very civilised, but agony for the candidates. Glyn Mathias is in Cardiff, where he's been observing a famous day for his nation. Glyn, a tremendous amount of attention, not least because so little will be known tonight about the assembly elections. Well, indeed, it has been a momentous day electing the first ever National Assembly. The count, as you said, doesn't happen uh, until tomorrow morning. The counting you can hear going on behind me is for some local council elections. Our poll, our election night poll, shows that Labour is by no means absolutely certain of getting an overall majority in the Assembly. It shows them on a range of between 28 and 32 seats. They need them 31 to get that overall majority. Touch and go, it looks as if Plaid Cymru have put up a very good performance. Not enough, perhaps, to stop Labour getting an overall majority, but very nearly. It's going to be a knife-edge uh, day tomorrow as that counting takes place. Glenn, thank you very much. Well, we don't have any results from Wales, but we have some news from the local elections in England. Hugh Edwards has been watching them from Millbank. Hugh. Kirsty, thanks a lot. There are 10,000 English council seats up for grabs tonight. The last time this happened four years ago, it did mark a very low point for John Major and the Tories and a very high point 
for Labour. So far tonight, Kirsty, very early days, I should say that, but um, we understand the turnout in these council elections in England is exceptionally low. It may be as low as 26%. That would be unprecedented, certainly, in, in recent decades. So that's something we're keeping our eyes on. There will be hundreds of Tory gains, certainly maybe a thousand or more, but whether that's enough to secure William Hague and to make him feel a little better about things is quite another matter. Another thing we're keeping our eyes on. Now, we'll be in touch with developments up and down the country. We think there's a big result due very soon in uh, Sheffield, where the Lib Dems are hoping to inflict a big blow on the Labour Council there. Jane Corbyn is in Sheffield. Jane, what can you tell us? Well, as you join us, Hugh, it's just been confirmed. The Lib Dems have taken Sheffield. They have won the necessary eight seats to take it from Labour and Sheffield has always been known as a Labour bastion. Indeed, they've held it with the exception of one year since 1929. So it's a big night for the Lib Dems. They're already celebrating. Labour have conceded defeat. Sheffield is now Liberal Democrat. Jane, thanks very much indeed. We'll uh, also be keeping an eye on Peterborough over in East Anglia where the Tories are hoping to wrest control there. At the moment, it's neck and neck between Tories and Labour. And in the West Midlands, we'll bring you the story from Bromsgrove. A Tory win here would certainly be a big boost for William Hague's party. And Kirsty, we'll also have the uh, intriguing results of a poll on identity. How English the English now feel, how Scottish the Scots now feel, as the political landscape is changing so rapidly. That's coming up soon. Back to you. Thanks, Hugh. Well, part of the excitement in any election is Peter Snow and his box of visual tricks. And tonight, Peter's a lot of explaining to do. Throughout the night, he'll be joining us from his bunker to make sense of it all with the aid of his latest graphics. First, Peter, though, what about this poll? Right, Kirsty. Well, we talked to 4,000 people in Scotland and 4,000 people in Wales. First, the Scottish people, and we talked to many of them indeed after they'd voted as well to check up how they'd voted. And here's what we think happened in Scotland. Now, these are people's first votes, the votes for the constituency seats. 42% for Labour, 30% the SNP, equaling their best ever back in October 74. First vote there for the Conservatives, 13%, and the Liberal Democrats on 11%. Now, those could be a bit higher, a bit lower, 3% possible error in a poll, so it could be a bit higher, a bit lower, but Labour clearly well ahead on that first vote. Now, the second vote, the vote for the top-up seats, that means that overall, the share of the seat should roughly equal the share of party votes. Proportional representation. Labour a bit down, the SNP a bit up, that could help them in parts of Scotland, and the other two parties roughly the same for both votes. Now then, let's have a look. There's Edinburgh Castle. Just down below that will be where the Scottish Parliament will sit for the first two years, but down below that, the bottom of the Royal Mile, a mile away, in front of Holyrood Palace, a great new building is now being constructed. The new Scottish Parliament, the Holyrood Parliament, we've got a glimpse of it. Our artists have been in there, been in the, looking at the plans, and they've got this picture of this massive chamber here, and now I'm going to fill it up with our projection of the members of the Scottish Parliament, starting with the likely largest party, Labour, under Donald Dewar. Now, we're giving a range here, because, of course, the poll could be up or down a bit, as I said on those figures. 55 to 61 for Labour under Donald Dewar. 55 to 61 seats in this 129-member Parliament. The Liberal Democrats under Jim Wallace, 10 to 16 of them. And then next, the Conservatives under David McCletchy, the uh, Conservative leader in Scotland, 11 to 17 of them. And finally, the Scottish National Party, almost certainly be the largest opposition party, the formal opposition party in the Scottish Parliament, between 41 and 47 under Alex Salmon. People have been saying if he got less than 40, he'd be in trouble. Well, he's looking like getting comfortably above 40 seats. Now, let's just take a global look at this new Scottish Parliament. With the winning post here in the middle, 65 you need for an overall majority. There it is. 129 members altogether, Labour with 55 to 61, short of the winning post, even at the top of that range, would need the help of the Liberal Democrats on 10 to 16 there. Whatever the size of the Liberal Democrats and Labour on the basis of our poll, even at the bottom of the range, they should just about be through it, whether they're in formal or informal cooperation. So it does look like control for Labour provided there with the Liberal Democrats. Here you have the Tories with 11 to 17 and the Scottish National Party over here. Now, on to Wales. We talked to 4,000 people here as well, many of them after they'd voted. The first vote in Wales for Labour, 45%. Plaid Cymru's first vote for the constituency seats, 26%. Best ever for Plaid Cymru in any election, 9% better than in uh, European election of 94. 
The first spread for the Conservatives down there at 14%, just ahead. Uh, fight there for third and fourth place between Lib Dems and the Conservatives. Now, the second vote for those top-up seats. Here we go. Up goes that Labour bloc, a little short, 41%. Doing rather well here, applied Cymru in the top-up votes. Again, very useful in South Wales, where all those Labour seats are, the constituency seats. It'll pick them up a few extra top-up seats there. Here, the Conservatives and Liberal Democrats, much the same there in that second vote. Now, the shape of the Welsh Assembly. Here we go across Cardiff Bay to this magnificent new building being erected now. Richard Rogers designed it, the design of the Millennium Dome, up the stairs, into the chamber. It won't be used for two years, but it's a, a sort of dream we'd like you to have a look at. This is our artist's impression of it. Here it is, a round chamber, 60 members all together, and the likely largest party is again going to be Labour. Watch them, the Tories, the Lib Dems and Plaid Cymru, the Welsh Nationalists over here. Let's just take a bird's eye view of all that and see what it's all going to look like. Here we have the winning post, this time at 31. 60 members, 31 would be a majority. Labour, between 28 and 32. Again, we're giving you a range here because of the possible error in our poll. The Conservatives on 7 to 11, the Liberal Democrats on 4 to 8, and Plaid Cymru over here on 13 to 17. Now look at the winning post. Labour <coughs> could at the top of the range of our poll be through the winning post, at the bottom of the range of our poll could be short of it. So we're in for a very exciting night indeed, Kirsty. It seems that you seem to be particularly excited by this voting system. Does it make it completely different for you? Oh, well, indeed it does. It's, 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 it's quite complicated. I think when you understand the voting system, it actually makes a lot of sense. What it's essentially doing is saying, let's have lots of constituencies, representation, just like in a normal general election where people actually have MPs they can identify with in a constituency, plus this idea of a regional top-up, which means that the, the share of the seats for each party will, in the end, when you add the two types of seat together, roughly equal their share of the vote. Many people say it's fairer. Thanks very much indeed. Well, I'm sure Roy Jenkins is watching. Well, political reaction to that poll in a moment, but first we've got outside broadcasts across the length and breadth of Scotland tonight, covering more than 30 declarations. Anne Mackenzie's at the Glasgow Count. Scottish Secretary Don Dewar is expected there any moment. Govan, again, one of the most fiercely fought contests. Ian McQuart is in Edinburgh, where we'll find out if Scottish Tory leader David McCletchie can win the Edinburgh Pension seat. If he doesn't, he gets a second chance because he's top of the list in Lothians. We're also in Falkirk West. That's where the Westminster MP Dennis Canavan failed to be selected by the Scottish Labour Party to fight this seat. He's now standing against the new Labour candidate. How will he win his way to Hollywood, if indeed he does? And we'll be hearing how the Scottish Parliament is viewed from the Orkney Islands. We'll be asking people there if Holyrood rather than Westminster makes any difference to them. Jane Franchies and Macduff, she'll be keeping an eye on the SNP leader Alex Salmon's reaction as the votes stack up. And from Inverness, the capital of the Highlands, We'll be hearing if a new political party, the Highlands and Islands Alliance, will make their way into the Scottish Parliament. Well, over the next seven hours, we'll be joined by many leading politicians here in the studio. Let's get a brief reaction from our first panel to predictions in that poll. I'm joined now by Charlie Kennedy, Sir Malcolm Rifkind, Ian Blackford and Douglas Alexander. Um, Douglas Alexander, if this poll and the range of this poll mm. is anywhere near correct, then the people of Scotland don't want you to be in charge. Christy, on your own. It's, it's much too early to make that kind of prediction. I mean, the votes that really matter are actually being counted. What it would suggest, if it was replicated right across Scotland, is not just that Labour would be the largest party, but also that separation, the policy of the Scottish National Party, has been decisively rejected. And the Liberal Democrats, indeed, putting in a very poor performance, coming behind even the discredited Conservatives. Well, I mean, the SNP, I mean, presumably, if you hadn't called Cosmo unpardonable folly, and if you hadn't put a penny in tax, you think you'd be doing better tonight? No, I think we've had a super result. I mean, if this, well, uh, this if isn't the, a result, <laughs> let's just say this is purely, <laughs> this purely is, a, okay, a the survey exit of poll, opinion. If, if the exit poll was anywhere near correct, then we'll have had a super result tonight. But your poll indicates that we could have put 50% on the results from the last time round. This is a stepping stone to independence. The, the Scottish people have a new feeling of self-confidence that they're, sh they're shown through the referendum, the show in tonight, we'll build on that and continue to take Sc Scotland forward towards independence. Now before I speak to the rest of the panel, we're about to find out when we're about to get that famous first result here in Scotland. We've sent our Moscow correspondent Alan Little into deepest, darkest Lanarkshire. He's at the Hamilton South Count. Alan, is this the place they want to make history? They do. They want to be the constituency that, that elects the first Scottish uh, member of Parliament. Uh, the first member of a Scottish Parliament for 300 years and uh, uh, they've got a very well-oiled machine below me. This is the hall that made history in 1967 when Winnie Ewing was propelled into Parliament by a landslide 
and very, at that time, very su surprising and shocking uh, victory for the SNP. That's, in a sense, where it all started. And there's a great sense in this hall tonight of history coming uh, full circle. They've got 167 workers beneath me. They're expecting the declaration very soon. And uh, they, they're determined that they're going to be the first constituency to declare tonight. How soon do you think? Any ideas? It could be it could be minutes away. The we we could have it certainly in the next 20 minutes or so, barring last minute hitches. That's fantastic. See what direct labour does when you get them into a counting booth. Um, Malcolm Rifkind, um, perhaps what Ian Blackford was saying was right then that if the SNP vote is at this level, back where they were in October 1974, then it could be a stepping stone to independence, and the ball has started to roll. Well, what happened in 1974 is they got 30% of the vote. What your poll is predicting they get now. Five years later, they lost all their seats, uh, and therefore that also could happen again. But um, as far as the Conservatives are concerned, of course, you'll be looking no gift horses in the mouth, whether they come from regional lists or otherwise, because proportional representation has put you back on the map. Well, we've always recognised that our recovery in Scotland will not be dramatic, it will not be overnight. It has to be a slow, steady recovery. If your poll is correct, if we have 17 seats in the Scottish Parliament, well, we have zero at the moment. 17 on zero is a pretty good bit of progress for one night's work. Well, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to ask you, Charlie Candy, about uh, Sheffield in a moment. But yeah. first of all, I mean, on, on this poll prediction in Scotland, it doesn't look like you've done particularly well and that you may be fighting to make any particular demands in a coalition government of Labour. Well, I don't think we should get over-obsessed with coalition because there's a number of outcomes here on the arithmetic. There may be a coalition. There could be a minority administration. We've made clear throughout the campaign that might well be a plausible outcome and not an unhealthy one from the point of view of democracy. If you've got a government with no overall majority, perhaps even Dennis Caravan holding the balance of power all on his own, heaven forbid, that would be an entertaining thought. They would actually have well, to work with the grain of the parliament on issues like tuition fees. Well, let's, uh, let's uh, go back to our first past the post day and uh, look at the English result and look mm. at that result first of all in Sheffield. Sheffield very good indeed and uh, we've also take, t are taking control of Stockport so that's a further step forward and I think that we'll increase our uh, comparative standing in Liverpool. So this is us emerging uh, in the English elections as being a very credible opposition to the government of the day. Mind you, the turnout is looking extremely low, but um, we look as if we may actually get a declaration from Hamilton in as little as two and a half minutes' time. But first, let's go straight over to uh, Labour's campaign headquarters, Delta House in Glasgow, where David Porter is waiting to speak to us. David. Kirsty, very good evening from Delta House, as you say, the headquarters of Labour here. And as you were saying, there is quite a bit of excitement building here now that the thought that that first declaration might be quite soon. The office behind me is part of the area where Labour's campaign has been coordinated for the past month. And we will know within the next few hours whether, in fact, the campaign, from Labour's point of view, has been a success or not. They've very much been campaigning on one theme, the theme of trust. They say that Labour was the party that brought devolution to Scotland, so the people of Scotland should now trust Labour to run the new parliament and the new government. A little bit later on this evening, we'll be expecting a visit from the Scottish Secretary, Donald Dewar. That will be in the early hours of the morning. Who knows by then, he may be the first minister-elect. But one thing is certainly sure here, that we're in for quite a long night but I think a pretty exciting one here as well. I think he'd be delighted if he was the first minister elect by the early hours of the morning, but you never know. Um, John Pienaars at the Scottish National Campaign Headquarters in Edinburgh. John, um, are they looking at that uh, poll with some interest? They've been watching the poll with a great deal of interest. I think the party workers, you can see some of them behind me, joining some of the journalists who've been following the campaign, are crossing everything and hoping that they might squeeze an extra we percent or two right here now. and there. We think we're going to get a declaration company. at Hamilton, John. If you just hang on, please, we're going straight over to Good Hamilton. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Here is the result of the Hamilton South parliamentary constituency. The number of votes for each candidate are Adam Ardry, Scottish National Party, SNP, 6,922. Tom McCabe, Scottish Labour Party candidate, 14,098. Margaret Mitchell, the Scottish Conservative and Unionist candidate, 2,918. John Oswald, Scottish Liberal Democrats, 1,982. There were 88 spoiled papers, and with a majority of 7,176, I declare that Tom McCabe is elected. There we have it is there. It, we can see that Tom elected, McCabe, the leader of South Lanarkshire Council, has made the sure Scottish that the Hamilton Parliament. Count is the first Count to return a member of the Scottish Parliament. Here is Tom McCabe. 
Thanks very much, Alistair. Ladies and gentlemen, first and foremost, I want to offer my very sincere thanks to the people of Hamilton who have turned out today and voted Labour. I firmly believe they've voted for the achievements of a Labour government and they've voted for the vision of a Labour party for our new parliament in a better Scotland. I also want to say a very sincere thanks to all those people who worked so hard during the past four or five weeks and in the time before that to achieve this historic victory. Could I say a very special thank you to my election agent, Brian Duffy. Our next victory will be tomorrow when we begin the work of building a better Scotland. Wherever your politics, there is plenty to celebrate here tonight. We have a new Scotland and we do have an opportunity to build a far better Scotland, one which is well placed to make its mark in the world and to bring Scotland forward as one of the leading democratic nations. This parliament is the settled will of the Scottish people and I think we all have an obligation to make it work. More importantly, I firmly believe that the parties who have contested this election have an obligation to ensure that they commit themselves to make this parliament work for Scotland. Could I make a special mention of the other candidates who have contested this election with me? We hear a great deal about a new politics for Scotland. Detail. First of all, the share of the vote, Labour took 54%, SNP 27 Conservative 11 and the Liberal Democrats on 8%. And let's look at the, the change now, the change from the 1997 general election. Labour's in fact down 11 percentage points, that is roughly in line with our poll. SNP is up 9 percentage points, Conservatives up 3 and the Liberal Democrats up 3. Before we go to the panel for reaction, Brian Taylor, what do you make of that first result? I think the, the, the swing to the SNP is quite substantial. It has to be said that within our election night poll, there were indications that Labour might perhaps perform less well in its west of Scotland traditional heartland than perhaps it was in the rest of Scotland. So we should be cautious about reading too much into what I think is about a 10-point swing to the SNP in terms of the, the national picture. But nonetheless, a substantial swing their way. But of course, it has to be said, the outcome, the single outcome, is that the first member of the Scottish Parliament is a Labour member. And he was determined to make history by being first, obviously. As leader of the council, and as a position to affect that as well. Uh, David Denver, Professor of Politics at Lancaster University. What do you make of that result? Well, I mean, one of the, the problems in generalising from a single result like this is that in Scotland, the pattern of electoral competition varies so much from constituency, constituency to constituency. And it's also the case that in some parts of the country, personality counts for quite a lot, in the Highlands and Islands, for example. So although there's lots of Labour SNP seats in the central belt, which this, you know, might go roughly like this, there are other places where it's SNP versus Conservative or Lib Dem versus Conservative, and you can't generalise from the Hamilton result to that kind of uh, constituency. But it will be interesting, as the night progresses, looking at the cumulative votes from that whole area into the region, to see how people use particularly their second vote. In oh yes, area. I mean this is one of the great unknowns of this election, is what will people do with the second vote? Um, their indication for the poll was that you know, Labour vote would be lower in, 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 in this, for the second regional vote. But it really is an unknown. This is where it's like an exciting step into new territory for everybody. Well, what do you make of that then, Douglas Allen? You're first member of the Scottish Parliament. It's a very strong result. My strong congratulations to Tom McCabe. It was a tremendous victory for Labour. I think you've got to realise this, well, this is just two years into the Westminster Parliament. It's virtually unprecedented for a government two years into a Westminster Parliament to be polling this level of success. So I think it's a good harbinger of things to come. What do you think it makes uh, for you, Ian Blackford, on the possibilities of a second vote? Well, it's, it's a super result, I have to say, uh, for us. I think uh, on the second vote, we'll have to wait and see. But one thing is clear, if we have this swing throughout the west of Scotland, then we'll be taking seats from Labour tonight in Scotland. Ah, uh -huh, you will, will you? <laughs> then you'll be taking Glasgow Govan. Well, we'll wait and see, but certainly if that swing is repeated throughout the west of Scotland, there'll be two or three seats we'll be picking up from. Well, there, there may only be one result from Hamilton South here in Scotland, but in England there have been a whole number of results. Um, Hugh Edwards, have they started to shape up any pattern, for, particularly for William Haig? Well, Kirsty, it's a big night for lots of us, and it's certainly a big night for uh, William Haig, because uh, he really does need to make 
very big gains this evening in terms of council seats uh, in England if he's to prove that uh, he's getting the party back on track. As we know, four years ago, the Tories had an absolutely disastrous night. They lost up to 2,000 councillors, so William Hague really has to at least gain 1,000, some say 1,200, some say 1,300 tonight if he's going to prove that uh, he's back on the rails and uh, that things are not quite as bad as they've been in the last two weeks, Kirsty, because he's had a pretty disastrous fortnight. But an early blow um, for both Tony Blair and, of course, David Blunkett, uh, losing Sheffields to the Liberal Democrats. Oh, no doubt at all, and a very good win for the Liberal Democrats taking Sheffield, which has been such a Labour stronghold for so many years, so Lib Dems will be very, very pleased about that indeed. Uh, for Tony Blair, of course, it's a big, big night for him too, simply because we can at least say that uh, it's a judgment on the new Labour project, if I can call it that, in so many areas which turned red four years ago, and whether those people locally like new Labour or not, perhaps we can judge on tonight's vote. The turnout, Kirsty, is very, very low, so that may undermine the judgment, maybe as low was 26 percent anyway Kirsty, let me just update you on what we have so far this is the scorecard if i can call it that so far this evening the labor having lost control of three councils lib dems having gained control of one we know that it's sheffield uh, conservatives no change so far uh, no overall control up by two independents still on nil let's move on to councillors because what we can see there is that councillors are down by 51 for labor lib dems having gained a few councillors some nine the tories having gained over 50 they need to gain many 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 more than that in order to do well tonight others having lost nine the independents having lost Two. Moving on to some of the specific gains, uh, Lib Dems having gained control of Sheffield, as we mentioned, and Stockport. Others on the list for us, Labour losses, Wire Forest having been lost and Hindburn having been lost so far tonight by Labour. Uh, Labour having held Thurrock, Exeter, Portsmouth, Worcester and Sandwell. And uh, they've also held on to Tameside, Wigan, uh, Derby, Basildon and Stoke-on-Trent. As I was saying, it's a very, very big night for the Prime Minister, Mr Blair. It's a big test, as we were underlining, of, uh, of New Labour's popularity in those council areas which turned red for the first time four years ago. As we were saying, for William Hague, a crumb of comfort that he can hardly do any worse than John Major did in 95, but he's got to show once again that uh, his party is not quite as divided as uh, some people are making out. And uh, Paddy Ashdown, of course, his final set of local elections as leader... Lib Dems started the day as the second biggest party of local government, but they might end the day in third place. We shall see. And to add to all that excitement, Peter Snow will be with us all night to give details of our survey of voters and to give us a hint of what we might be expecting. Over to you, Peter. Well, Hugh, we've now had a large number of these key wards. We've got a thousand key wards which give us a picture of the countrywide strength of the parties how the parties are doing countrywide, 350 of them declared so far, three quarters of a million votes in England. And this gives us a, a first stab at the projected share of the vote all over the country. Of course, we will have, from Scotland and Wales, local elections building up uh, over the next 24 hours, and that will give us a really much more general picture of how it's all going. But at the moment, 35% it looks like for Labour, 33% for the Conservatives, just 2% behind Labour. Here in mid-term, they should be doing much better. 27% the Liberal Democrats, equal to their best ever in a local election projected share of the vote, and 5% the others. Now, the change that that represents on the general election of 1997, hefty downswing for Labour, up go the Tories by just 2% from an atrocious general election result after all two years ago, and the Liberal Democrats doing pretty well there, up 10%. Very low turnout, very unreliable, therefore, these essential, the message of this, is just a broad message of this picture, is to be treated with a grain of salt. Now, let's bring down our springometer, and here we have the uh, vulnerable Labour MPs here. Look how they go down to a swing to the Conservatives, and if there were a swing uh, to Labour, then those blue Conservative MPs would turn from blue to red. Now, of course, for any point of swing, for any point of swing, there's a different outcome in the House of Commons. With the Labour majority of 179, a socking great Labour majority, the Tories need no less a blue swing here, no less than 7.5% to wipe out Labour's majority altogether. And to win an overall majority, they need a record-breaking swing of 11.5% for a Conservative majority of one. Where are they now? Well, on the basis of that projected share of the vote, they would be down here, the Tories, down below a Labour majority of one there, down to 5.5%, which would still see Labour back with a pretty comfortable majority at a general election. And don't forget, this is a mid-term when the opposition should be doing very well, steaming ahead so that they can 
they no doubt will lose some momentum towards the election. It's going to be very, very difficult for the Tories to win the next general election. Now we're going to have a look just at the benchmarks here, just to give you a guide to what to watch for in the British council elections. As you were saying earlier, if Labour go down below a thousand, then they're not doing terribly well compared to the way they're doing nationally at the moment. So the Labour Party looking for a thousand uh, lot is overall minimum. If they get worse than that, it's not too good. If they get better than that, in other words, they lose fewer than that, it's not too bad for Labour. The Tories, watch for a thousand gains. If they gain about that number, then they're roughly where we expect them to be. Still not doing very well, but uh, roughly where we expect them to be. If they do better than that, the Tories are doing better than expected. If they do worse than that, and only make about 500 gains or no gains at all, well, of course, they are making gains. We've seen them making a few. They're going to make quite a lot of gains, a few hundred perhaps. If they make a thousand, they're doing all right. Uh, then we have here the Liberal Democrats. Expect them to lose about 200 seats altogether. If they're doing better than that, and they certainly are showing signs of doing very well, if they're doing better than that, then it certainly is a bit of a triumph for the Liberal Democrats. Great. Now we can uh, perhaps go straight over and speak uh, to Alan Mackay, who with him, I believe, has Dennis Canavan, perhaps even just to explain all those postal votes. Alan. That's right, Christy. I've got Dennis Canavan with me, one half of this fascinating contest tonight between old Labour and new Labour. Now, Mr Canavan, initial soundings on the postal vote sounded good from your point of view. That must please you. Yes, well, I, I did hear that 90% uh, of the postal votes were in my favour, but I take that with a pinch of salt, you know. I'll believe it when I see it. Uh, no, I'm optimistic, but cautiously uh, optimistic. But you've got a very broad smile across your face. Well, yes, uh, but uh, I'm a wee bit worried, actually, about the lower than usual turnout, lower than at a general election. It was higher than at a lo local government election, uh, but not nearly as high as at uh, a general election. And uh, I worry about things like that, and I wonder why people were staying at home rather than coming out to vote, and I just hope that my supporters did get out to vote. What are you putting that turnout at yourself from your own signings? Uh, I think about 60%. And um, from looking at the papers, the ballot papers coming into the hall, what are you and your staff thinking about uh, the results in uh, an hour and a half's time? Well, I've only been here about five minutes, and I just had uh, a brief work with my agent and uh, some of my counting agents, and uh, they tell me that things are looking good. But uh, no, I'll, I'll reserve uh, judgment until the, the ballot boxes are all opened and the votes are counted. It's been a long haul. What have you based your campaign and your attack on Labour? On what issues? Well, I think that I've uh, tried to uh, distance myself uh, from certain aspects of uh, Labour policy. I've fought a positive campaign on things like the right to work, on things like the right to a free education, including higher education without tuition fees, and with the restoration of student grants, particularly for students from low-income families. And I've also fought a campaign to maintain the National Health Service as the property of the people, accountable to the people and responsive to the needs uh, of the people. Uh, and I think that another big issue in this campaign has been the issue of local democracy and the right of people to decide who their candidate should be without central control or outside interference. Dennis Canavan for the moment, thank you very much for joining us. And it's back to you, uh, Kirsty, in the studio in Glasgow. Thanks very much. Um, Douglas Alexander, do you regret he's not in the Labour fold as a, a putative MSP for Scottish Parliament? Was that a big mistake? Well, I think we've all applied for jobs and been unsuccessful in our time, and Dennis, along with everyone else, to put themselves forward to be Labour candidates. There was a selection procedure. We stand by that procedure, and we'll wait and see the outcome of the result. Now we're getting some more details about Hamilton South. It seems that the turnout at the general mm. election was 62.8%, and now it's 54.8%. That's quite a substantial drop, Charles Kennedy. Yeah, I think it was about the national average, about 70. I look at the experts at mm. the general election, yeah. but 62 at the referendum. Sorry, yes, it's the referendum. Uh, so, so it has been showing <clears throat> a continuing dip. I think the interesting thing about that is the three opposition parties all made progress. Labour fell back in terms of total numbers showing up. Now, it hasn't had an effect on the outcome in Hamilton, but in tighter contests, differential turnout, that awful technical term, in other words, how many of which... <laughs> clans 
people actually stay at home and how many make the effort to go and vote, that may have a knock-on effect in terms of individual seats. Well, we'll wait for that and have a look for it's that. It's all about um, motivation of Labour voters, actually, rather like the referendum itself. Right, well, let's now go straight over to Hamilton, where Alan Little is waiting to speak to someone who is clearly a very proud man tonight, as he made sure that his declaration was first. Well, Hamilton South was determined to be the first uh, constituency to declare. It was. It declared a few minutes ago. Tom McCabe is the first person to be elected to a Scottish Parliament, the first member of a Scottish Parliament for 300 years. Tom McCabe, to borrow a phrase of Tony Blair's, do you feel the hand of history sitting on your shoulder? I think it's a very significant achievement, but the results weren't important at the time, quite frankly. But clearly it's something that will be remembered here in Hamilton that we managed to be the first. What about your majority? It's half of what it was in 1997 for this constituency. Why? Well, I think there's a much lower poll here. I think one of the things we picked up uh, as we spoke to people in the streets is that they were very, very happy with the Labour government. They were happy with the things that had been done on education and on health. And they felt that Labour would automatically almost uh, be successful in these elections. So perhaps a Labour government that's delivered has encouraged a little bit of complacency and perhaps that's something we have to work on. Yeah, I don't want to take anything away from your victory because the result was quite decisive, but nonetheless, yeah. there is a swing to the SNP of 10%. Yeah. You're down 11%, they're up 9%. Yeah. If that's repeated across this part of Scotland, you're going to lose seats to them tonight, aren't you? Well, I think it's a, uh, it's a reflection of the percentage poll. Uh, we were somewhat disappointed, I think, at something in the mid-50s. Uh, again, I think that was much to do with the fact that some people felt it was an almost automatic result. So clearly with a higher poll, I think that result would have been very different. But with more than two to one in our favour, it would be difficult for us to be disappointed. Now let me ask you where you stand on the Lib Lab question. Are you a Lib Lab fan? Are you, are you, are you prepared to go into a coalition government for the first time in, in, in mainland British politics with the Liberal Democratic Party? Well, I'm a fan of the programme that Labour put forward for this election. I think it shows a vision for a new parliament and a vision for Scotland and we very much want to implement that. I stood in that programme uh, and I want to play a part in, in making sure that, it's, that it, it is implemented. I think we can do that as a Labour government in that parliament, and that's what I'm looking forward to. OK, Tom McCabe, Tom McCabe the first uh, member of the Scottish Parliament in 300 years. Back now to Kirsty. Thank you very much, and we can go straight up to the northeast of Scotland, where Jane Frankie is with the SNP leader, Alex Salmon. Yes, thanks, Kirsty. As you say, I've been joined by Mr Alex Salmon, leader of the SNP. Your reaction, first of all, to the BBC poll, Mr Salmon? Well, if, if that poll were, were accurate, it would be a sensational result for the SNP. I mean, almost 10% up in our general election performance, around the best result in the party's history. I'd be highly delighted with that. But the indications from Hamilton is it might even be better than that. You were indicating earlier that there was a feeling that it could be better than that. There was an air of quiet confidence amongst all the people that are here with you. What, what, what made you say that? What made you think that, that it could be better? Well, it's early days yet. I mean, if uh, your poll is accurate, then that'll be a great performance from the SNP. I, I just happen to think that Labour have fought such a negative campaign, a, a really depressing campaign, and I actually think they may have demoralised their own support. And I think they've got extreme difficulty in getting people out to vote. And we'll see at the end of the evening, but I've just got a hunch that the Labour Party are in for a hard lesson tonight. If you fight a negative campaign, you demoralise your own Labour supporters. What does the low turnout in Hamilton tell you? I mean, 50, 54 percent, something like that? I mean, considerably lower than it was during the referendum, for example. Well, I think that is the result, in my view, of Labour's negative campaigning. I mean, I, I think they've fought a thoroughly depressing campaign. We've tried to fight a positive campaign. I think if you fight a positive campaign, you mobilise people to come out and vote for you. You offer them something to vote for. If you fight a a negative Millbank tendency campaign like the Labour Party, yeah, then I think you succeed in depressing people. So it may be, and it's early days yet, and let's not extrapolate from one result and all the rest of it, but it may just be that the Labour Party are about to be hoisted in their own baton. Are you quietly forecasting any particular numbers amongst yourselves? I, I must ask you, because of the air of confidence there is here, I mean, and I know it's carefully practised. Well, the, the Scotsman newspaper, which I must say I've had some hard words for in the case of this, this campaign, have been kind enough to give me a case of champagne for, for winning the Premier League uh, points table for political performance in the Are campaign. You sharing that? Well, I'm just saying it looks like it might come in handy for the SNP tonight. Thank you very much Thank indeed, you. Mr. Sam. Thank you. Well, one area where Alex Hyam would have a smile on his face was if uh, the SNP won Glasgow Govan. And that was one area where there was indeed a swing from Labour to the SNP at the general election. Anne McKenzie is with the sitting MP, Mohamed Sarwar. Indeed, Kirsty, I should just mention you're talking about Hamilton's low turnout. It does appear as if across Glasgow there is a very low turnout. Normally it's low in Glasgow, about 66% of the general election. But in this case, lower still. And in Govan itself, surprisingly, only 45%. 
Well, she said Mohammed Sawar joins us now. Do you have any indication as yet, Mr. Sawar, as to how it's gone? It is very difficult to predict uh, the results. As you may appreciate that in the last general elections, turnout in Glasgow Govan was 62%, and in this election, turnout is uh, 45%. But I'm fairly confident that uh, Labour will retain the seat. Con confident even though it seems that the poll I'm appears to indicate an 8% swing to the SNP. It, it is last time uh, there were predictions and SNP was saying that we have won Govan, and uh, you know that uh, Labour won Govan. So I, I hope uh, this is the case this time. Do you think that the controversy surrounding your own position since the general election has affected the Labour vote within government? After my court case, uh, over the last six weeks, I have uh, campaigned in government. There were hundreds of people who came to see me, shook hands with me and congratulated me. And uh, they were delighted that uh, I have won the case. And they told me that they always uh, kept their faith in me. And I have served them with the best of my ability over the last uh, two years. But it does seem, I mean, looking at the low turnout, 45%, as if certainly everybody has failed to galvanize the voters of Govan. It is, it is not uh, just in Govan the turnout is low. In other Glasgow constituencies, uh, in general, turnout is low. So it's not the indication that this is because of the controversy in Govan. It does seem... It is definitely the SNP's best chance. It has gone to the SNP twice before. I mean, you are putting on a brave face, but it does have to be said it would be extremely good result for Labour if you hold on. SNP has won this seat twice in the past, and it's SNP ran a campaign over the last two years uh, to win this seat. And we had the opportunity to campaign in Govan only for four to five weeks. And uh, if we win Govan, I think that will be excellent result for Labour Party. How much of a disadvantage do you think it is that, that your candidate apparently seemed to have a, a bit of discontent directed toward him from his own party? They were saying he was parachuted in, whereas the SNP candidate is now well known and established. No, the only difference is that Nicola Sturgeon fought uh, the general election against me and she was known uh, in Govan and Gordon Jackson was new to Govan. But I think he is a good candidate and uh, he will win. Right, we shall see Mr. Sarwar. Thanks Thank very much indeed for the moment. Back to you, Kirsty. Right, well, straight from Govan down to Cardiff, where there's lots of excitement in Wales because the first National Assembly of Wales is being elected uh, and also council elections across Wales. Um, Glyn, first of all, is still the indication the whole thing's on a knife edge? Uh, well, the latest figures we have do show that Labour have a projected number of seats in the Assembly between 29 and 33. That's a slight adjustment uh, from what we said before. So uh, they're at best only probable uh, of getting a majority, by no means certain on these figures. And there are all sorts of rumours sweeping in from around Wales about what's happening in different parts of the country. The turnout is thought to be lower than the parties had hoped for, lower perhaps even than the referendum uh, 18 months ago, less than 50%. And there are reports of Plaid Cymru doing quite well and the Liberal Democrats in certain patches uh, around Wales. So whether Labour can get that overall majority, we'll have to see tomorrow. What um, does any of this suggest for Alan Michael, if indeed it suggests anything? I think uh, Alan Michael's position is most definitely on a knife edge. Uh, we don't know uh, in detail uh, how the figures from Midden West Wales will shape up. That will come later on uh, on Friday. Uh, but uh, he is certainly, uh, I think, uh, very doubtful uh, as to whether he can get a seat unless Plaid Cymru win Carmarthen East and perhaps Plaid Cymru may need to take another seat from Labour in order for him to get his. I'm joined by Ron Davis, who was a former leader of the Labour Party in Wales. Let's that point first, if we could. Uh, Alan Michael, do you think he will get in? I do, yes. Uh, the, the point that has to be made, of course, is that we haven't got one single result yet. The figures you're quoting are just based on exit polls, their projections, and Wales is notorious for having a, a different pattern of uh, voting in each constituency. So I think we have to wait to see we, until we get the results before we can see what's actually happening. But as far as Alan's concerned, I have no doubt at all that he was polled very, very strongly in Mid and West Wales, and I'm confident he will win a seat. And are, there the con are there contingency plans in case that doesn't happen? Well, I'm not aware of any, but obviously uh, the, the party has to look at all, all matters. Now, is, is Labour going to get an overall majority? It does oh, yes. look on the knife edge there, doesn't it? No, we hold 34 seats at the moment out of the 40 parliamentary seats, and I'm confident that we'll hold all those, uh, those 40 seats and perhaps pick up one uh, additional seat as well. That will give us an overall majority uh, of six, perhaps eight. No, that's not what our findings show. No, but I, I've been...
Aberdeen North. The counting is now well underway for that constituency and obviously they look now as though they will be first to declare. In that contest, Labour's Elaine Thompson is defending a comfortable 10,000 majority, although the SNP claimed to be pushing hard. Their candidate, Brian Adam, incidentally, is third on the party list, so if he doesn't strike it lucky on the first past the post uh, contest here, it looks fairly likely that he will actually get in through the additional member system. As I speak, the counts for Aberdeen Central uh, the ballot boxes have just arrived and that count is just about to get underway as well. Joan? Aberdeen South is going to be the most interesting seat th there though, isn't it, when it could go any of three ways almost? Yes, very much. That is one of the country's key marginals. The Lib Dems' Nicholas Stephen is uh, fighting strong in this seat. He's fairly confident uh, that he can claim that, although he doesn't want to be too confident because uh, a while back there, he uh, actually lost after claiming that he was going to take the Aberdeenshire or the Concarden and Deeside seat as it was back then. Um, alongside him is uh, Mike Elric fighting for Labour. He's a former press officer for la uh, late la Labour leader John Smith. And of course, uh, the Conservatives are also pushing hard in this constituency. So it should be a very interesting vote when that one comes through. Mark, thank you very much indeed. Look forward to speaking to you later. Now we can go up to Orkney, where David McKeith is waiting for the Liberal Democrats leader, Jim Wallace. David. The smallest constituency in Scotland, but nonetheless one of the most important constituents, a brand new constituency created especially for the Scottish Parliament, and of course Jim Wallace, the leader of the Scottish Liberal Democrats, hotly tipped to win here. He's not here at the moment, he likes to take a break during the evening, he's not expected till around about midnight, but all the indications are he will win, as for the other three parties, it's wide open voting here is well underway and the final ballot boxes are being brought in by pilot boats and declarations expected around half past two for both first past the post and indeed the list vote. There's already been excuses made about the weather in central Scotland for low turnout. What's the situation in Orkney? Well there can't be any of those excuses made here. It's been a fine dry day. Voting tra traditionally in this area is uh, difficult to predict. It seems to have been a steady turnout is what the, the, the experts are saying so far. What we have to look for is just how much the farming vote will influence uh, the outcome here. If, if Couple up in Aberdeenshire here, two key ones in Lothians. First of all, David McCletchie, the Tory party leader, is trying to win the seat that Malcolm Rifkin lost in the general election. Again, all the same seats in the general election being fought again here. Edinburgh Pentlands, uh, that is the one that David McCletchie is challenging in, and his uh, Douglas, James Douglas Hamilton, his next door neighbour there in Edinburgh West. He lost that seat in the general election to the Liberal Democrats. It's flashing, as you can see, gold for the Liberal Democrats. He would like to win that seat, but both of them have been wise enough because they may not win the direct constituency seat, the directly elected constituency seat. They've both been wise enough to put themselves at the top one and two on the regional list for Lothians, which means that they may get that top up seat, those top up seats in Lothians, if they don't get the directly elected seat. Here's David Steele. Another person to watch, he'd like to be presiding officer or speaker of the Scottish Parliament. He's top of the Liberal Democrat list in Lothians. You can see Lothians, the region flashing away there. Tommy Sheridan heads a list of Scottish Socialist Party challengers in Glasgow and other parts of Scotland. Uh, then we have again on the regional list seat, Lorraine Mann. She's head of the Highlands and Islands Alliance. And she is at the head of the list of those Highlands and Islands Alliance candidates in Highlands and Islands there. And here's Dennis Canavan. Independent now in Parliament, sacked by the Labour Party, standing in Falkirk West, against Labour in Falkirk West, also head of the Dennis Canavan list. You can do that if you're an independent. Dennis Canavan list in central Scotland. And finally, no account of the Scottish personalities to be complete without a look at the Ewings. There's Winnie Ewing. She's the Highlands and Islands member of the European Parliament for the last couple of decades. And she is challenging. She's top for the SNP there. Her son, Fergus, as we mentioned earlier, is also on the list for Highlands and Islands. His wife, Margaret Ewing, MP for Murray, she's also on the list for Highlands and Islands, so she'll have a pretty good chance of getting in. And finally, Annabel Ewing, a rather longer shot, uh, Winnie's daughter, and she's in mid Scotland and Fife, challenging the Stirling seat, and also she's on the list, number six on the list, for mid Scotland and Fife. Thanks very much. Well, let's just take um, these uh, targets and uh, go straight to Ian Backford and say, Four Ewings in the Scottish Parliament. I'm sure they'll all be a credit to the, the Parliament. They'll certainly all been credit to the party over the last number of years. I'd be delighted to see them all in Scotland's Parliament re representing Scotland's party. It certainly wouldn't be a quiet place. 
No, it wouldn't. I mean, we're in there to noise the place up a bit. I mean, this is the, the first stage for us. We're clearly on our way. I think we are going to have a good night tonight. And we have to demonstrate that we can deliver for the people of Scotland, that we can argue for the things that the people of Scotland want to see. And I'm sure all the Ewings, if they're there, along with the other SNP MPs, will be doing a, an outstanding job in that parliament. Well, well let's turn, turn to Malcolm Women looking at, at targets, and particularly your own territory and I mean, What chance, realistically, on these predictions are there that David McClatchy will win on a first past the post? Well, I was very pleasantly surprised by the Hamilton South result. It's not good territory for us, but our vote is actually up. Our actual vote, as well as our percentage, is up on the general election. Whereas if your opinion poll, your exit poll was correct, our vote should actually be down compared to the general election. So if uh, the, actual, the real results we are now seeing in Hamilton South, if that was typical, and I know it's very early days on one single seat, but that would imply uh, that our vote throughout Scotland is going to be higher than at the last general election. And that's the first time we've seen that in this campaign. There are many different factors. Uh, each constituency has its own quirks, and we've certainly got ours. Um, and you know, that will be one of the factors which people uh, vote on. But how will they vote? Both camps claim identical polling results, so could the bickering leave a gap and allow the nationalists to slip through? If I thought that by standing that I was going to split the traditional Labour vote and allow the SNP or somebody else up the middle, I wouldn't be doing what I'm doing. I wouldn't stand. Let's go over now to Dennis Canavan, who's at his count. Dennis Canavan, we've just heard you saying that if you thought you'd split the vote, you wouldn't stand. What are the early indications there at your count? Well, I'm uh, optimistic. Uh albeit cautiously optimistic. I mean, uh, I heard that uh, the, in the postal votes there was a massive majority in my favour, but we can't read too much into that. And uh, I'm going to wait patiently until all the ballot boxes are opened and counted before pronouncing judgment. But if you do split the vote, will you have big regrets about standing as an independent against the Labour Party? Well, I said that, and uh, I, I stand by what I said, but I don't think that's going to happen. Uh, I think that uh, what is going to happen is that the, the people of Falkirk West are going to vote for a representative rather than a puppet. I think that they want someone who will fight to represent their interest in Scotland's new parliament. And by the way, I don't believe uh, in the status quo. I want to see a much fairer deal for students, for example, by the abolition of tuition fees and the reintroduction of student grants, especially for students from low-income families. I want to see not just the maintenance of the National Health Service as the property of the people of this country, but I want to see our National Health Service being improved. And I want to see more people getting the right to work. That's not a belief in the status quo. That's a belief for progressive change. So on some of those issues, then, we can be faced with a Dennis Canavan who's voting with the Conservatives in a Scottish Parliament against Labour. I would look at each issue on its merits, as I have very often done uh, in the House of Commons. And it doesn't bother me too much who's voting uh, with me. I mean, if I think that by voting with a party other than Labour that I could abolish tuition fees, I would do it. And I think it is ironic and incredible that the Labour Party, which once was the party of free education, has been hijacked by new Labour the party of fee-paying education, and I would certainly be voting against that nonsense. You say that, but you, you said earlier that you wouldn't want them to lose the seat because of you. You wouldn't want the SNP to get in through the middle of splitting the vote. Why is that? Why do you still have that, that loyalty deep down somewhere to the Labour Party? Well, I was virtually born and brought up in the Labour Party, and I still look upon the Labour Party as my natural home. And I would like, whatever happens tonight, I would like to think that there could be some uh, reconciliation and I say that to my friends and colleagues in the Labour Party, uh, some of whom have been very supportive of me, some of whom have actively helped me in this campaign, that I do think that a message uh, which the Labour Party leadership might get from the ballot box here tonight is that it's time for a change. Think again. There are certain aspects of new Labour policy, particularly on education, which must be changed. Dennis Canavan, I have to stop you there. We'll join you again for your count. Dennis Canavan looking for reconciliation with the Labour Party there. Bernard. And Dennis Canavan also indicating that if he gets in either in Falkirk West or through the list that he'll be part of a coalition against tuition fees, saying that he was cautiously optimistic 
and waiting patiently. At that point, we'll take a short break now, but join us in a couple of minutes. Some more declarations are expected very soon, and we'll see what our panel reacts to them after... As you can see, uh, in the full glare of uh, these lights, is well underway now. It's been going for about an hour and a half. It's still going to be a very long night. Labour are extremely confident. Edinburgh is a Labour city nowadays. Though there is, of course, the memory of the Tory presence here, and obviously most attention will be on Pentland seat, Sir Malcolm's old seat, where David McCletchy, the Scottish Conservative leader, is hoping to lead the revival of Scottish Conservatism. But Labour, as I say, looking very strong elsewhere. Then, of course, on the list seats, we have the SNP, and I'm joined now by the Scottish National Party Treasurer, Kenny McCaskill, who's forecasting some very big uh, a surge by the SNP. What, what many seats are you expecting to get? Well, we don't know as yet, but certainly I think what we're going to see is SNP representation on the council. We only had one by-election victory uh, up until the cessation of the last council, but we're quite confident there's going to be council seats throughout each constituency. Four or five seats on the list, though, for the Parliament? Oh, I think so. I think we're good for that. A lot will depend whether we win first past the post in West Lothian, but certainly I think we're good for four or five in the list. It doesn't seem that overall the SNP has made the historic breakthrough you were hoping in these elections. Well, I think we've made a substantial breakthrough, and I'm happy the way things are going. If we get up to above 50%, we get representation in the City Council, and we get list members back, we're delighted. Why did the campaign not appear to, to actually hit the mark? Well, I don't think that that's necessarily true. I think if you speak to SNP activists, they've been happy with the way the campaign is going. Some people maybe had unrealistic expectations for us, but we've reached a new plateau. It's not that long ago since we had no representation and no parliament. We've now got a Scottish parliament and substantial representation therein. It was an uphill struggle for you here, though, wasn't there, with the war in Kosovo and the SNP's position on it? Well, I don't think so. I think that then, end of the day, didn't really have a marked effect upon voters. People really? Not even here in the housing estate? I don't think so. I think at the end of the day, people in the housing states are voting for a new change, and we, have a, we believe that the Labour control in the City of Edinburgh housing scheme is beginning to rock. But it's still a Labour city, isn't it? Not for not much longer. Okay. Kenny McCaskill, thank you very much. It's going to be a long night. We're not expecting the first result before about 3 a.m., so we're going to camp beds out now, Kirsty. Very much indeed, Ian. Well, um, the men and women who are elected to the Scottish Parliament will be making history in the last Parliament in 1707 was housed in a beautiful building on the Royal Mile, which is now part of the law courts. The new modern parliament, designed by Enrique Morales, is being built right at the bottom of the Royal Mile, opposite Holyrood Palace. Um, so the MSPs will go there in two or three years' time, or perhaps just two years' time. But until then, they're in the shadow of Edinburgh Castle, and indeed in the shadow of John Knox, in a building that normally houses the General Assembly of the Church of Scotland. Historian Louise Yeoman begin, joins us from there to begin her magical mystery tour of Scotland's three parliaments. Well, Kirsty, it's here in the Church of Scotland Assembly buildings on Edinburgh's mind that the 129 MSPs will be taking their seats next week for the very first time. Tonight I'll be taking you on a historical mystery tour of this and the two other Parliament buildings which lie off Edinburgh's Royal Mile. The Parliament of the past, which dissolved itself in 1707, and the Parliament of the future at its new Holyrood site. Join me tonight for a tale of three Parliaments. Louise Yeoman, we can go straight now to Cardiff, where their assembly building has been designed by Richard Rogers, and speak to Glyn Mathias, who has some interesting people waiting to talk to us. Glyn. Well, thank you, Kirsty. I'm joined by four representatives of the four political parties to get their view on how it's going. Of course, the count isn't until tomorrow. All we can really discuss is the poll findings that we've had so far. Peter Haynes, very dodgy as to whether you're going to get an overall majority in the assembly. I think we will get an overall majority, and if and when we do, it's an extraordinary achievement in mid-term of a Labour government against the background when the party's been tearing itself apart in Wales for the last year, especially over a very bitter leadership campaign. So to have been in this position, I think, is a fantastic achievement, and I'm confident that we will be able to form a government and that Alan Michael will be the leader. Uh, Peter Hayden, of course, is the campaign manager for the Labour Party. I should have said that. Uh, has it been a good campaign? Clyde uh, Cumley appears to have done rather well. Clyde have been where we expected them to be. They're the second largest party on the vote, uh, but we still look like having roughly twice the number of seats that they will get. And that's, uh, again, what I think is a healthy position for the Labour Party. And, you know, again, I say this is mid-term of a government. The real interesting thing of this election, too, is the disaster showing of the Tory party and what a crisis, again, this is for William Hague. 
which has seen his vote in Wales collapse even from its low point at the general election two years ago. Right, let's turn to Mark Phillips, the chairman uh, of Plaid Cymru. You've done well compared to the last general election, but not well enough probably to stop Labour running the Assembly. Well, we've travelled our vote from the general election, if this poll is to be believed. But I think tonight is about celebrating the birth of a new democratic institution in Wales. Many of us have fought for a very long time for that. And the fact that that is going to be a creative chamber where there isn't going to be dominance by one party is, is, is very valuable to Wales. But there may well be dominance, they may well have overall control. Oh no, if they have overall control it'll be by a very slim margin. And I think that will influence the way in which debate is conducted and will, and will usher in a new era of creative political thinking in Wales. Lembert Oprick, Liberal Democrat MP for Montgomery. Uh, you look as if you've been squeezed in this election. Oh, just one point first. Let's remember we're celebrating a liberal dream, uh, which we actually <laughs> started talking about before Plaid and Labour even existed as parties. But that small point aside, uh, we're actually feeling pretty buoyant. Uh, I've been talking to our activists in this room today, and they're really pretty buoyant. We think that the votes held up, and according to the exit poll, actually has increased on the list versus what we even achieved in the 1997 general election early days, but I think we'll be celebrating a little bit tonight and an awful lot tomorrow. Nigel Evans, a Conservative MP for Ribble Valley and spokesman on, on Welsh affairs, uh, a bad performance by your party. I don't know where you get that from, and indeed I, I, I've heard Peter Haynes spin doctoring as he, as he continues uh, uh, with his political career up the greasy pole, but the fact is... You think you're going to increase your vote, Nigel? <laughs> well, you think you we've are, already heard uh, one local government election result here in Cardiff, which was very good for us, an increase uh, in the Conservative share of the vote. We're hearing other increases in the Conservative support throughout the country at local government level. I think we should wait just a few more hours until they start counting the votes for the Welsh Assembly. But what we, I think, should all be concerned about is what we know, which is that there's been a low turnout. Lembit talks about this dream. Well, it's a dream that's not shared by at least half the Welsh electorate, and that not gives me great, great, cause, great cause for concern that they haven't turned out to support all right, uh, the candidates in the Assembly elections. Peter Hayne, on the turnout, it does seem it's going to be low. We don't know yet how low, but it does seem if it's going to be low. It does look lower than I would have liked. It, again, it doesn't surprise me. This is a new institution. It's being held on the same day the election as the local council elections, and they were only 40% last time. So, you know, uh, I, I think what this assembly needs to do is over the period of its first term of offices, earn the trust, earn the respect, show it's delivering for Wales. And then I do think we'll create a new politics in Wales, and I agree with uh, Mark on this, that I think we'll see a new politics, which I think the Tories, judging by tonight, are still struggling to come to terms with, in which everybody is involved, which will be good for Wales. But Mark Phillips, uh, coming to terms with a low turnout may make it difficult for the people to accept the Assembly. Well, the, the Assembly exists, and from day one it'll start influencing people's lives, and certainly for the better. Uh, and, and, and that's very important, and it's in that context that this performance will be judged, and we'll see a, a much more realistic turnout in, in subsequent elections. And a final word to Lambert Opic. It does seem that the turnout is going to be quite variable, uh, low in the city, for example, here in Cardiff, and pretty high in the country. I think that's going to have a big impact on the actual outcome compared to the predictions that you've made in your poll tonight. Gentlemen, thank you very much for joining us, and back to Kirsty. Thank you very much, Glyn. Uh, and now we can go straight to Colin White in Aberdeen, where there's a three-way marginal in Aberdeen South. Colin, um, any indication yet that the turnout has been the same as roughly what we were expecting now from our um, out poll and also from Hamilton South around the low 50s? Yeah, it's uh, expected to be the low 50s here as well, Kirsty, um, equivalent in some areas to, to the council election. So the turnout is very low indeed here as well, reflecting the national picture. Any other news though? Pardon? Any other news about declaration times? No, we expect uh, Aberdeen North possibly to be announced within the next hour. Uh, Aberdeen Central will be after that, and Aberdeen South, just within the last couple of minutes, have uh, just declared that they're about to start counting, so that'll be much later on. Um, West Aberdeenshire, Gordon and Aberdeen South, the three main seats of contention here, uh, and uh, they'll be much later in the morning. And of course, um, the SNP took the Euros seat, so presumably there's high hopes there, because, partly because of that and the momentum it caused. Yeah, I mean, the SNP were cock a hoop with winning uh, the North East Euro by election in, in November with 48% of the poll. But the Tories as well saw that as a considerable revival as well. They finished second, knocking Labour into third place. And the Tories in the North East are pretty hopeful of uh, sparking a revival up here. They've got hopes for West Aberdeenshire and Kincardine and in Aberdeen South. Those are the top two target seats for the Tories. And they're also hopeful in Gordon as well. But it's, it's those three seats which are really going to provide the drama in the North East tonight. Thank you very much.
much, Colin. Well, at this stage in the evening, everybody's waiting for the next uh, result, and then what will happen is a whole flood of them will come in. But we can go over to Joanna McCauley, our radio reporter at Eastwood. We're going to go to her in about a few minutes' time and find out what's happening in Eastwood, because that's going to be one of the earliest ones to declare. But let's hear from Peter Snow with all the latest whiz-bang graphics he's got about English elections and what happens to Hague in the midterm. Right, Kirsty. Well, now, every parliament, I suppose, is a bit like a racetrack with the parties jostling for position in the race. And history suggests that the secret to winning a race is to have a lead in the opinion polls in mid-term, and that's where we are now, that'll allow you to go on to win the next election, particularly if you're in opposition. Now, let's just go back over the last six parliaments and see how these races have gone. First of all, 1974 1979, Jim Callaghan in the red car, Mrs Thatcher, Margaret Thatcher way ahead of him in the pit stop in mid-term. There she is with a 12% lead over Jim Callaghan. She went on quite comfortably to win the next election. Well, then she faced Labour in opposition over three parliaments. And in each of those parliaments, Labour established small leads. Michael Foote, 3% in the mid-term pit stop there. He went on to lose the next election. Then we had Neil Kinnock. He went into a mid-term lead there, you see just ahead of Mrs Thatcher, 3% lead, but he went on to lose the next election. Then Neil Kinnock, the next, uh, next, uh, next parliament, he went on to make a lead there of 7% over Margaret Thatcher in the mid-term. He went on narrowly to lose the next election to John Major. Well then of course we have the 1992 to 97 parliament. And here, look what happens. Look, there's John Smith, way ahead there of John Major, establishing a 20% lead in opposition over John Major in the midterm, exactly where we are now in this parliament. There's the midterm pit stop. There's John Smith. He hands over to Tony Blair. Tony Blair sweeps away there to victory in 1997. So, there's the background of the current situation. Big leads here for John Smith in 1994, uh, handing over to Tony Blair. Big lead for Margaret Thatcher back there in 76. Those two opposition parties went on to win the next election. These three opposition parties with the small midterm leads went on to lose the next election. Now, where are we at the moment? Well, this time it's Tony Blair in government in the red car with lead. And look at the lead he's established over William Hague in opposition. 26% midterm here in the opinion polls, leading the opposition by 26%. It's the opposition who should be in the lead, so if William Hague is to win the next election, he's going to have to turn all the records in electoral history upside down. Thank you very much, Peter. And now we can go straight over to Anne McKenzie, who's joined by Nicola Sturgeon. Anne. Thanks, Kirsty. Nicola, any indications as yet? Have you won it? Oh, I don't know yet. It's very early days. It looks as if it's quite close, but uh, we'll know more in a short while. But uh, we're quite confident. It is a low turnout though, is that good or bad for you? 45% of it? It must be seen, I mean it is a low turnout, uh, I think that's uh, a result of Labour's negative campaigning. I think Labour have uh, tried very hard and succeeded in uh, scaremongering in this election campaign. They've tried to demoralise people and I think they've uh, succeeded in demoralising many people, uh, perhaps especially their own voters. Well if you are talking about describing Labour's campaigning as negative, I mean that's part of politics isn't it? Perhaps you should have expected it. No, I think parties have a responsibility in elections to set out the stall to argue their case and try to convince the voters to vote for them. The SNP's done that, we've run a very positive campaign, it's been very upbeat and we've tried as hard as we can to inspire voters in this very historic election. Labour on the other hand have been entirely negative, scaremongering, using pejorative language at every opportunity and I think that's been counterproductive for them. But you have perhaps given them a few gifts of your own, for example you have a large Asian community mm. in Govan, do you think that Alex Salmon's remarks on Kosovo might have had some effect on that community? No, I think we have strong support amongst the Asian community. I find the Asian community very understanding uh, of Alex's comments and in agreement with them. Uh, you you know, know, the Asian has, community, the Muslim community, I think, agreed with what he well, said. Well, uh, the Asian community know that the bombing uh, in Yugoslavia has not helped the people it was intended to help, which are the, the, the Kosovars, and the Muslim community are obviously very sympathetic to them uh, and understand their plight, and they know that their plight has been made infinitely worse by the, the NATO bombing. Uh, so I don't think that has been adverse for the SNP at all. Uh, Alex Salmond has been proved to be correct in his comments, and I think he has uh, been proved to be courageous in standing up for what he believed in. It does have to be said, though, that uh, in a constituency like Govan, you need a 4.5% swing. Bearing in mind the unfortunate events that have dogged the Labour Party over the last year or so, mm. if you don't win this, then where are the SNP going to make inroads in the central belt into well, Labour seats? The SNP has just had a 9% increase in its vote in Hamilton. 
Uh, the SNP is doing very well. I don't think it's fair to govern or any of the candidates to uh, place the, the outcome of this election on, on one constituency. The SNP's result will be judged on its performance around the country and the early indications are that that performance will be extremely good indeed. But you have tried very hard in your campaign to target what could be called the old Labour vote talking about increasing uh, money into public services and so on. This should be the kind of constituency where that's gone down big time. As I say, if, if it hasn't, if there isn't a huge swing to you, then what does that say about your campaign? Well, let's wait and see the result. But uh, I think the messages that the SNP has put forward in this campaign have been immensely popular. Uh, and you know, we've been playing on the, the consensus on the middle ground of Scottish politics. And I think that's where we've won uh, a lot of issues. And the issues of this campaign, the issues that the SNP's campaigned on, I think have been won by the SNP. Labour has avoided the issues of this campaign. They've tried to move on to negative ground. Uh, and the SNP has consistently and I think should be praised for fighting a very positive, upbeat campaign. Are you actually quite pleased to be apparently coming in second because it means you can snipe from the sidelines and <laughs> perhaps be uh, slightly more destructive than you would have had to be if you were in government? Well, and there's ma many, many results still to come in, so I think there's all to play for. Uh, but the SNP's fought a wonderful campaign and whatever role we play in the new parliament will play very well indeed. OK, Nicola Sturgeon, thank you. Thank you. Christy? And now for something completely different, because there's an Englishman abroad somewhere in a chip shop in Edinburgh, and his name is Michael Crick. Hello, Kirsty. Well, yes, I'm here in the Rapido Fish Bar here in Edinburgh, and they don't just do fish here, they do every conceivable kind of fried food that you can possibly think of. There's chicken, peppered chip steak, haggis, pies, scotch eggs. Uh, around here we've got battered mushrooms, onion rings, mixed vegetables. I mean, if you're on a diet, uh, perhaps it's not the ideal place, but if you like fried food, it certainly is. And, but the speciality here is haggis and turnip. It has been for the last few weeks, and um, I'll certainly try a bit of this. The, uh, well, for an Englishman, it is certainly, um, shall we say, different. Now, I have with me here um, three uh, Scots who've uh, been involved in the last few days and in involved in today's election. Now, the big question is, we've done a poll at the BBC, and we found that people in England predominantly regard themselves as being um, British rather than English, where the, whereas here in Scotland it's rather different. How do you regard yourself? Scottish. And what about you? Do you, do you write Scottish. Scottish or British on application forms? Scottish. Scottish. And do you think that the, the, the advent of a Scottish Parliament will do anything to change that? Um, I think it will probably reaffirm the fact that, that Scots are, are an individualistic nation. Um, that's it. Perhaps for too long we've been tied to a, a Westminster government which uh, doesn't um, reflect the, the socialist support in Scotland. And do you see a Scottish Parliament as a means towards uh, independence yourself? Yes, I think it will do. What, what about you? Do, do you see a Scottish Parliament as a means towards a, an independent Scotland? Um, I'm not sure about independence. It may be something that, that will fall on, but um, personally speaking, I would rather see what the Scottish Parliament achieves in its own right first before you know, making any judgment of what could fall on. Paul, what, what kind of issues do you think the Scottish Parliament should be asserting itself on and, and showing itself as being different from the Westminster Parliament? Well, hopefully uh, it should raise the profile of Scottish and get, uh, just break away from uh, being oppressed by the English for all the years and bring back what should always be given us in the first place. Are there particular issues for you, Mags, on which you think the Scottish Parliament should be asserting itself and showing itself to be different? I think certainly in the, in the business profile with um, you know, having a, our own identity within Europe, because too often you, when you go abroad, when people ask you where you're from, you might start by saying Scotland, but really when you go abroad you find people only understand Scotland, but more often England. Britain doesn't mean anything abroad. It's, it's England that they say, so I think having a Scottish Parliament will be able to say no, we are a country in our own right, you know, recognise it. David, how do you think that the Scottish Parliament will actually make a difference to, to people's lives here? Well, I certainly think that um, with, the, with the tax raising powers and, and obviously once the, once the Parliament actually grows its own wings um, and begins to get a bit more strength, a bit more confidence in the Scottish people, will perhaps follow the, the example of the Republic of Ireland and tuning ourselves in to, to aid from Europe and showing that we can actually stand on our own two feet. Okay, well, thank you very much indeed. For here from the uh, Rapido Chip Bar and Fish Bar in Edinburgh, back to you, Kirsty. Thank you. Just goes to show you can get some very strange people out late at night in Edinburgh. Um,
We are joined now by the Trade and Industry Minister, um, Brian Wilson. Brian Wilson, um, Douglas Alexander was brushing off the idea that this was a low turnout and saying, well, you know, if this would happen, wouldn't it? We're still very happy. But it isn't good for Labour, is it, when there is such a, a considerably lower turnout in, a, in, a, in an area where Labour is meant to have galvanised its support in the country? Well, as I, I was saying on radio a short time ago, I was out in my own constituency tonight and the, the turnout in Hamilton didn't uh, surprise me on that basis. It clearly was down in the the general election. It's been a rotten day in the west of Scotland. And I think the interesting question is where you have a, you know, big Labour majorities and where people know Labour are pretty certain Labour's going to win and win handsomely, you know, whether they've been sufficiently motivated to, to, um, to come out. So I think we needed a few more results to get a, to get a pattern. Um, but, um, you, you know, if, 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 if turnout is down, then clearly there's going to be smaller Labour majorities. That's pretty obvious. Yes, and, uh, yeah. and uh, the other three are going to reap the rewards, Mark and Rickon. Well, I think, in, quite apart from the implications for the results, I think it's actually very sad because, you know, there's been a tremendous uh, sense of excitement that has been generated about these elections, the first Scottish Parliament for 300 years. I actually expected the turnout to be rather the same as a general election, at least, and for it to be as low, not just in Hamilton, but from what we're hearing in Govan and elsewhere. That's very worrying because it actually implies that the degree of commitment of people in Scotland to the changes that are taking place is perhaps not as substantial as uh, all of us or would perhaps, like to believe. Or perhaps they thought that by um, standing up and kept being counted to the referendum, they kind of done the business. Well, maybe. I don't really think that's a, an adequate explanation. I mean, I think when you have the first elections for the Scottish Parliament, uh, one might have expected people who had come out strongly to vote for it to at the very least vote in the first elections to it. But Ian, uh, but the fact is the government has spent two and a half million pounds on a kind of education campaign to explain not only about the election but the way to conduct yourself in the election. Um, was that not enough or was it simply it wasn't the right campaign? I think perhaps it came too late, Kirsty, but uh, Brian mentioned that it had been a bad day weather-wise in the west of Scotland. It's been a bad campaign from Labour. When you preach negativity for the last four or five weeks to the people of Scotland, attack the SNP, put fear, doom and despondency into this campaign, it's hardly surprising I mean, their vote hasn't will, turned will out. You, are you proud of the divorce is messy, divorce is expensive, the, the, the very negative election broadcast, or is that just the, the modus vivendi of late 20th century politics? Well, I think this is just... You know, I, you know, I mean, the voting's finished. I mean, well, you are, stop, you are. stop the party political broadcast, you know. <laughs> but, but everything, that is ne everything that has decided is negative also has decided is positive. I cannot think of anything more negative than to say that we should break up Britain in the, in the, last, uh, in the last years of the 20th century. I think that is the most negative message anybody could give that we should turn people against each other within a small island. It's incredibly negative. And I think it's really positive to say, look, we are one people, one island, let's work together, work, let's work the new for Britain. better democratic institutions within it. Incredibly positive message. And that's, uh, you, know, you know, so one man's negativity is what another man's positivism. And I've, you would hear Nicola Sturgeon, I've never heard Nicola Sturgeon utter a positive syllable in, his, in her life about anything. I mean, it's whinge and carp politics ad nauseum. And then they come on and say, oh, everyone's awful negative because they don't all agree with the SNP. Well, uh, Brian, Brian will say, it, does have, it day, does have to be said that straight <laughs> after the referendum, you, were, you came onto this programme and did quite a bit of nat bashing. It does seem that you, you know, well, you're I'm very against, eloquent in nat I'm bashing. Against, I'm against nationalism. I don't like national, nationalism as a creed, as a philosophy. I do not want to break up these small but, islands into separate states. And that's a very positive thing in my but view. But in fact, um, Charles Kennedy is a Liberal Democrat. Could you do business with the Scottish National Party, despite what David, said, David Steele said in The Guardian about being difficult to go over a number of hurdles with the Nationalists over a variety of issues. Could you do business with them? Well, we made clear that we can't do business at the end of the day on the basis of uh, planning or projecting this country forward to Scottish independence. Um, people can vote for independence if they want to, and they'll get independence if they vote in sufficient numbers under the previous first-past-the-post Westminster system, under this system, under a referendum, under any other system you care to devise that's democratic. But the fact is, an insufficient number of Scots have ever shown a tendency to want to vote for independence. And it looks like tonight, 70% of those who have gone out to vote have positively not voted but for independence. But it's interesting, because Charles Kennedy, you are, prepared, you are prepared to give your, as it were, your reason for not, or, in, or your benchmark for not uh, supporting yes. the nationalists. It's a defining it's reason. It's a defining reason. It's not so like a policy not, issue like well, tuition well, fees or petrol prices. It's a defining political issue, which is quite right. constitutionally set. So is there any defining political issue which will bar you from working with Labour? There's no defining political issue. Um, Jim Wallace has been at pains every press conference of the campaign. He's been asked the same question. Is no, this issue fundamental stumbling block? Is that yeah, issue he said, fundamental Yeah, he said the other night, from here to Holyrood, 
tuition fees were non-negotiable. The will of the Scottish people against he tuition has, fees... He has made absolutely clear, and I agree with him, that tuition fees and plenty of other issues are absolutely central to what we put forward. And the more of us we get in this Parliament later tonight, tomorrow morning, the more we will be able to push that agenda forward. So let, let's just be quite clear about this. If um, there is a, a lot of toing and froing, if indeed tomorrow the position is that Labour and you treat together, and uh, it wouldn't necessarily be you, of course, because you won't be in that parliament, but your colleagues. Jim Wallace's and chair. if the, if Labour comes and says, look, you know, we you can come along with us, and you can have a couple of cabinet seats, but as far as we are concerned, tuition fees are here to stay. Mm. You just they just walk away. Well, as you say, it's not the discussion that I'll be party to if even such a discussion takes place. And I think we're very, very premature at this stage in the programme of even anticipating such a thing. But I think Jim has made quite clear uh, what the benchmarks that we've stood on this election platform are, and that's what will carry us forward into the future. Well, we can go straight over to the Liberal Democrat leader's constituency, Jim Wallace's constituency in Orkney and Ken MacDonald. Ken, you've got a ball with you. Yes, indeed. Um, this is uh, the bar uh, from the bar game, the famous game that's played on Christmas Day and New Year's Day between the uppies and the doonies through the streets of Kirkwall and they board up the, the windows of the, the shops because otherwise the sheer crush of the players forces people straight through the shop windows. And it's a sort of a, a, ti a titanic struggle going on, if, if you like. And I suppose tonight the symbolism of this is, well, in the new Scotland, the new democracy, we have a whole new bar game. What I can tell you is that the, the nights here are starting to get deliciously short, but I think we're going for a quite a long night tonight. Jim Wallace has just arrived, and I think the, the vote that we thought we would have the result maybe about half past two, I think it's going to be closer now to about three o'clock possibly. And uh, among the, the logistical considerations which you have to bear in mind are, are that this may be the smallest constituency in Scotland with 15,000 voters, but many of these voters are on outlying islands, and they're being, the, the ballot boxes are being brought in at the moment in uh, fast launches because the Islands Council, who are also the, the, the people who are organising this count, they're also the Harbour Authority. So uh, we, we've got a, a wee bit of a, a while to wait yet. Thank you very much, DK. And we go straight down to the other end of the country into a beer parks in Dumfries. A beer. Hi, Kirsty. Well, sweat breaking out in a few brows here, but the returning officer, who I'm sure you'll know is a highly colourful character, gave us a burst of Tina Turner's You're Simply the Best just to keep us all inspired. We are expecting two constituency declarations here tonight between about one and two o'clock. One is for Dumfries, which is a Labour held seat. The other for Galloway and Upper Nithsdale, which is an SNP held seat. Now both were stolen from the Tories in the 1997 election, uh, producing some of the biggest swings in the country. Dumfries looks safe for Labour tonight, but judging by what we can see here from the papers that are coming out of the boxes, the situation for Galloway and Upper Nithsdale isn't quite so clear cut. It looks like the Conservatives have stolen back quite a few of those votes, so we wait to see what happens there. Um, the Conservative agent believes that last time the vote was anti-Ian Lang, and that um, adds significantly to the Conservatives coming back into the fold, as well as their candidate um, fighting a very forceful campaign. We also have seven regional seats here. We believe that those will be split between uh, the SNP and the Conservatives, although uh, but it's also believed that maybe Labour and Liberal Democrats could steal one back. Thank you very much indeed. We'll be straight back down to Dumfries as soon as we have any news. And now we can continue our tour, magical mystery tour around the Parliament and join Louise Yeoman in the temporary home for the Scottish Members of Parliament. Well, Kirsty, I'm here at the Assembly Halls of the Church of Scotland, which will be the temporary location for the new Scottish Parliament. But it's a building which has a fascinating history all of its own. You wouldn't believe it, but this building was created by an ecclesiastical earthquake, the Disruption. On 18th May 1843, the Church of Scotland experienced a huge walkout. 470 ministers in a bid for independence from state control set up a new Church of Scotland, the Free Church of Scotland. And like the new Scottish Parliament, it needed its own temporary premises and found them, not here, but in a converted gas works. This building was the Free Church's Holyrood, designed by architect William Playfair, ready for 1850, dominating Edinburgh from its pole position on the mound. It was an object of desire, and in 1900 it was one of the subjects of an acrimonious custody dispute when the Free Kirk split. The matter went all the way up to the House of Lords, requiring an act of the Westminster Parliament to resolve it. Here the fathers of the Free Kirk debated heresy and sound doctrine, matters of faith and Westminster confessions, the theological kind. In 1929 there was a reunion. The Church of Scotland and the United Free Church came back together. 
At last the kirk got its hands on these coveted assembly halls. What better location could there be for the new parliament to start off in than this sought after and controversial building? Louise Young, well, let's stay in the capital and join Ian McWhorter, who's with the Cons Scottish Conservative leader, David McCletchy. Ian. Thanks, Kirsty. We're still a long way from a result here, uh, even though they're doing their best down there on the floor. But I'm joined by the leader of the Scottish Conservatives, David McCletchy, of course, is contesting hard for the Pentland seat, formerly the seat of Sir Malcolm Rifkin. Do you think you have much chance tonight? Yes, I do. I've not been on the floor yet, Ian, so I've, I've not been able to have a look at the papers for myself. Uh, but I've been uh, encouraged by our good performance in uh, Hamilton South, pushing up our share of the vote there by comparison with the general election. And uh, if we can repeat that in the other 72 seats in the country, then I think we're going to spring some surprises. But it doesn't look like you're restoring the fortunes of conservatism, at least in Edinburgh tonight. Well, we're going to restore the fortunes of conservatism throughout the country because we're going to get some representatives in the parliament and be a parliamentary party in Scotland again uh, after the results are declared tonight. And it's all about building uh, on that and, and, and from here. But you can't be hugely encouraged by our exit poll tonight, which puts you down at 13% in the first round. Well, I think we started the campaign at 10%, so it does show that we've been moving on up. Pretty uh, marginal improvement. Well, we'll see. It could make a significant difference in the overall result. And uh, I have a feeling that the exit poll is slightly going to understate our performance a little, uh, particularly when you look at some of the disparities in the turnouts and the low turnouts. Uh, I think our people are fired up. I think we might well do uh, better than that. So Why do you think... Days. Why do you think turnout has been so low? I think there's maybe an exhaustion factor in all of this. Uh, there are also some very big stories uh, driving uh, news uh, off, uh, off the front pages. Uh, you know, think of Kosovo and some of the other major stories that we've had. And you can't ignore the weather. I mean, it's been amazing. We've had you know, good weather for the whole of the campaign. And the day the voting takes place, the heavens open over lots of Scotland. So a number of factors, I think. Do you think it might have been, though, that the electorate just was turned off by the election campaign they were presented with? I don't think was so. Was it too negative? No, I didn't think it was too negative. I thought ours was very bright and breezy from day one. It was. <laughs> yes. David McClatchy, thank you very much. Thank you. Okay, Kirsty, still three o'clock our earliest time. Thank you, and there'll be a lot more results to come before three o'clock in the morning, but perhaps not any in the next perhaps about 20 minutes. But now we can go straight over to Alan Mackay, Grangemouth, who's got some quite extraordinary intelligence. You've got some extraordinary intelligence, Alan Mackay. Yeah, well, I, <laughs> <laughs> I, at least you said it, Kirsty. I can only agree, of course. But um, the intelligence we have here is that uh, Dennis Canavan may be looking at getting 50% of the vote. Now, I have to stress that that is just observations from the floor. Now, at his highest point as a Labour MP, when Tony Blair got in in a landslide victory in 1997, he got 51.9. And, of course, he wasn't standing then against uh, the Labour candidate. Uh, that's early soundings, even from next door where the Falkirk East seat is being counted and where the list votes are being counted. We're hearing from Conservative followers that they've noticed that Mr. Canavan, who is an individual on the list vote, is also doing well there. Now, it's his followers who are the ones with the smiles on their faces that are dejected looks among the, the, the Labour Party. Uh, the SNP are being bullish about taking second place uh, were Mr. Canavan to uh, top the vote tonight. Thank you very much, Alan Mackay. Um, and uh, we, was, we must at this stage go to Peter Snow, who's itching to give us his latest amazing graphic. Well, Kirsty, just uh, let's look at the projected share of the vote all over Great Britain, based, I have to say it, very important, only on the uh, English local elections. Until we get results from Scotland and Wales in local elections, we can't be really clear what the projected share is. We make this tentative effort here uh, at the projected share, 36% Labour, ahead of the main opposition party in mid-term, a dreadful position for the Tories, 33% for them, 27% Lib Dems looking pretty good, they've done this before three or four times in the 80s and 90s, 27%, they do well in local elections, the question is could they do that well in the general election, 4% the others over here. Now, imagine the challenge, the millennial challenge to the Tories, a sort of roller coaster ride. A roller coaster ride of the way they should be going. The ups and downs from the May 1997 catastrophe, they 31% of the vote they had there. The ups and downs that they should be travelling on in order to reach the kind of peaks that will get them to win the next general election. 40, 45% last year. 
45% this year, perhaps up to 50, and 45 to 50 next year. In order to have the momentum, the coast down, they're bound to have some of the uh, lead that they have clawed back, oppositions do tend to, as the general election approaches. So they need, that, they need to scale those kind of heights if they're going to win the next general election. So where are they actually gone? Where is William Hague's roller coaster ride now? 31% of the last general election, let's see how he's got on. In the first year, he bumped up and down, and he ended up in the local elections last year with some 33% in May 98. This year, in these local elections, we're projecting his share of the vote at 33%, exactly the same as last year. Look where he should be, way up there on those heights up on the roller coaster up there. Here he is, way down here, with this record low share of the vote for an opposition party in midterm. 35% for Michael way back in the 80s, was the worst opposition share of the vote in midterm before, and look where Michael Foote got. So you can see what William Hague's position is now. Where's he going to go from now on? History suggests, of course he could perform miracles, of course there could be big surprises, but look at that roller coaster where he should be on the left. He's going to have to do most extraordinary things to avoid a real drowning at the next general election. Kirsty. Great hat. Um, Right now we can go over to Eastwood, which until the last general election was the safest Tory seat in Scotland. It's second on the Tories' target list tonight, and Joanne McCauley's there. Joanne, any news now from Eastwood? No, there's no news as of yet, but uh, the Tories are hopeful that this could be the place for the revival of their political fortunes in Scotland. As you said, it was at the safest Tory seat until the last election, when uh, MP Alan Stewart resigned his candidacy just, just before the election took place, after troubles in his private life. Um, the Labour took the seat with a majority of more than 3,000. So the Tories are fielding a very popular candidate, veteran councillor John Young, who's a well-known figure in Glasgow local politics. He's been on Glasgow Council for more than 35 years, and he's the former agent of Teddy Taylor, and he lives in Eastwood, so he's, he's very well known. Um, Labour are assuming that their majority of more than 3,000 in 97 will be pretty difficult to, to overturn so soon after the election. Um, they're fielding somebody hoping for a, a change in career, I, I believe, Ken McIntosh, who is currently a BBC producer. Um, the word Labour took on a different meaning for him recently, though. Um, his wife has just given birth to their first child. Thank you very much indeed, Joanne McCauley. Well, let's come back to our political panel here. We've been joined by uh, the MP Archie Kirkwood and uh, Conservatives Laura Strathclyde. First of all, Brian, Wil Brian Wilson, um, what would Dennis Canavan bring to a Scottish Parliament? Uh, well, he would bring a great deal of experience, obviously. He's been around politics uh, a lot of time, or, or, or a long time. Uh, I've no idea what the, the, re the result is, if it's, if it's as projected. Then he would obviously bring with it a great um, deal of, of, of support and affection from the people who put him there. So, uh, would that, would that suggest that the local, the local Labour Party um, made a, a great error of judgment in calculating the mood locally for Dennis Canavan? Uh, no, I, it wasn't the local Labour Party. That it was a, a national selection system in which an awful lot of people who applied to be Labour candidates lost sorry, out. So what I should have said was, sorry, sorry, the, the, sorry, what I said was the centre failed to address the mood of the local people. Well, the, the centre, the, 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 the selection process, and every party had one of these processes in, in, in reducing, uh, in Labour's case, I think from 900 original applicants to be candidates to bringing it down like, uh, to, to something like a couple of hundred. And a lot of people were disappointed in, the, in that process and, and Dennis took his disappointment to the, 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 length, the length that he did. And uh, you know, tonight we'll, um, we'll, we'll form a judgment on that. And you know, I don't think that, uh, you know, I don't think there's anything personal, certainly nothing personal on my part or any Labour MP's part about, uh, about, about Dennis's uh, role. Um, that he was part of a selection process, he, he didn't like the result and he took a different course. But do you, think, do you think that decision by the selection process was wrong? No, I don't think you can I mean, say... You worked I mean, with him at Westminster. Well, I've worked with Dennis, I know Dennis Canavan mm -hmm. a, a very long time, but I certainly wouldn't call into question the, the role of the selection panel. We did incredibly difficult jobs. I mean, if Scotland is a village, the Scottish... Come on, he's, a, he's, he's, been, he's, done, look, he's been a constituency MP yeah. who's worked so hard well, for that territory for so long, it seems quite extraordinary that a man who is held in such affection locally should be turned down. And it may actually be a thorn in Donald Dewar's flesh in the Parliament. Well, look, you, you can't go, you can say it's one of two things. You could say one, that uh, every MP who wanted to stand should have been automatically waved through. But if that had been done, 
then there would have been an outcry from another direction. But no, no, so no, you, no, you yeah, a, nobody was suggesting second, that. But you had a panel which went across the spectrums of the panel of, of the party, which rejected many, many people whom they knew personally and who had long experience in various ways, and they rejected a number of MPs as it, as it happened. But the one who took it to, you know, who decided not to accept that and to pursue his candidacy in another way was Bennett. And that's that's his democratic entitlement. Well, let's put it another way. Had he been the candidate, would you have been happy to campaign for him? Well, I'd campaign for any Labour candidate. Of course I would. Yeah. Um, well, let's broaden this out now and look just um, at uh, the territory of uh, Eastwood. And if you're talking about an old campaigner, you're certainly talking about John Young. I mean, if you, if your second target, Lord Southside, um, the indications are tonight from our poll is that you're not going to necessarily get any constituency seats. You'll have to wait for the list. Do you think John Young could confound that in Eastwood? Well, we'll have to wait and see. Uh, obviously, it would be a great uh, victory to have. Uh, you've got to remember, at last general election... He's standing against uh, Anna, Anna McCurley, who's a doughty uh, yeah. uh, Tory reformer. Indeed. But we had no seats. We've had no seats for the last two years. So we're coming from a, a long way behind uh, at the end of this uh, process, protest, pro process later on uh, uh, this morning. We will have Scottish Conservatives in every part of, of Scotland. So again. you have, a, you have proportional representation to be thankful, so it's rather churlish of William Hague to call it the most ridiculous system. Okay, it is a ridiculous system. We're opposed to it. And the reason why... <laughs> that, so, and the reason, so let me get this question. You're opposed to a system which opposed system to one... We're going to witness that this weekend. Right. This weekend it's like a dying man in the to life support machine. What, this, this weekend, what is going to happen? is that uh, the thing that nobody in Scotland voted for is going to be created when Donald Dewar and uh, Jim Wallace get together and uh, Donald Dewar is going to hand out the keys 